All right. So um, I am Chloe Van G. I go, I just go by Van G. That's easier to say. Um, so I am the assistant director at Huntington Beach Wetlands Conservancy with our executive director, John Via. And um, today I sort of just wanted to talk to you guys about who Huntington Beach Wetland Conservancy is. And um, so I was sort of wanna tell you, you know, who we are, what we do. I'm gonna walk through a little bit of the history of Huntington Beach Wetlands Conservancy, um, some recent events that we had in our past year, as well as some activities and projects that we have ongoing and some groups that are involved with us. And then um, for those of you who are interested in the sciencey part of things, I'm going to dive into a research project that um, I and a couple other researchers at California State University of Long Beach conducted um, during one of our recent events. And um, this research I, I did present at two scientific conferences this year. So um, you'll sort of be getting a, a good uh, view of, of you know, the most recent stuff that we've been doing. All right, so to get started, um, I wanna tell, tell you guys a little bit about who we are. So Huntington Beach Wetlands Conservancy is a nonprofit and it was uh, begun in 1985 from a group of concerned citizens who were worried about, um, you know, sort of the, the, the massive loss and destruction of the wetland habitats in Southern California. So they got together to raise some funds and their mission was to acquire, restore and protect the remaining wetland habitat in Huntington Beach. So this was a major effort and um, I'm you know, really happy to be a part of this. And we're really unique in that um, the land that we own, it is privately owned by us, unlike other protected habitats, which are state or federally owned. So we are our you know, own nonprofit that owns the land. And um, I think that's sort of a really special and unique thing about Huntington Beach Wetlands Conservancy. So currently we are the owners of uh, just under 200 acres of wetland uh, land. So to give you a little bit of history, um, this is sort of an overlay of what the historic Huntington Beach wetlands look like. And you can see that there is, um, you know, this flow of the Santa Ana River that brought fresh water into this floodplain. And then the ocean water sort of brought that marine. So we got that mixture of uh, that fresh and salt water that went into this floodplain that created about just under 3000 acres of marsh habitat. Um, now, what a lot of people ended up doing when they moved to Southern California is they sort of took a look at, you know, these types of habitats. They thought, hey, they're kind of just like smelly. There's nothing that really lives here. Um, I don't think it's a really important ecosystem. Let's just go ahead and build on top of it. Um, and so that's sort of what has led to the overall destruction of wetland habitat in Southern California. Um, specifically, that's been about 80% or over 80% of wetland habitat has been lost or highly altered in Southern California alone. So now you can see sort of that drastic reduction of what is now the current wetland habitat that is left in Huntington Beach, um, at least at Huntington Beach Wetlands Conservancy that you see there circled in blue. So we went from having just under 3000 acres of marsh habitat to having just under 200 acres of marsh habitat. So uh, you can sort of see why the Huntington Beach Wetlands Conservancy was started because this was a major concern. And um, you know, some citizens really wanted to protect what wetland habitat we had left to ensure that we didn't develop onto it. And we sort of you know, kept this habitat that turns out is a really important ecosystem that I'll sort of dive into. So a little bit of more history on how um, the Huntington Beach Wetlands habitat was uh, sort of altered in a way. So I told you that the current or the historical wetland habitat was sort of this mixture of that uh, Santa Ana River, plus the ocean water that came in into this floodplain. Um, now, in order to build on top of that area, we needed, uh, uh, you know, we needed to sort of stop the water flow to uh, getting into that area. So um, one of the ways that the marine water was sort of uh, reduced from going into that area was by putting in a transportation system, which we know as PCH. So PCH sort of broke up that um, sort of marine flow into that wetland habitat. And additionally, uh, they wanted to sort of control that freshwater flow in the Santa Ana River. So like many other rivers that we have, maybe we have in Southern California, um, it's sort of been redirected and a um, little bit altered in a way. So instead of being like a natural flowing river that floods out into a floodplain, um, it is now just a concrete uh, river essentially. Um, so, 
Um, and that's what you see a lot of in Southern California, unfortunately. And so that also reduced the freshwater flow that went into that floodplain as well. So by this time, you've sort of um, reduced the marine or the marine water that's going into the wetland habitat, and you've taken away the freshwater that goes into that habitat. So um, historically, you know, we started to lose those Huntington Beach wetlands, right? And that meant that the land could dry up and you could start to build and develop onto that land. Now, some of that land, um, you know, we were able to, at least the Huntington Beach Wetlands Conservancy was able to save instead of build on top of. But in order to save that land, what needed to happen was we needed to sort of restore that um, hydrologic flow to the habitat. And so that's sort of, um, you know, the, first step of um, getting this habitat to be restored to, you know, a more functional wetland habitat. It's not what it used to be, but it's at least a functional wetland habitat. Um, you can also see that historically in Huntington Beach, um, there was a major source of oil here, which was, um, you know, a huge demand for that. And so uh, what used to be Huntington Beach now is now you see mostly buildings, but uh, we used to have a lot of oil derricks on Huntington Beach land to sort of get that uh, resource. Um, a little bit more history of Huntington Beach wetlands. So this was a, a tragic event. We had the, um, the American Trader oil spill in 1990 that spilled um, you know, a little over 400,000 gallons of oil. So this was very devastating as you can see um, on the beaches there that the, all of that oil sort of washing up onto shore. And as many of you know, um, you've sort of seen the evidence of oil spills. This uh, negatively impacts a lot of bird species, a lot of fish species, invertebrates, um, pretty much anything that sort of lives in the water or on the surface of the sediment. Um, it is very detrimental event. Um, so in response, um, we actually, well, uh, the Wetland Wildlife Care Center sort of decided, hey, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense for us to uh, be close to an area that uh, is, can be heavily impacted by events such as this. So um, in about, I wanna say uh, 1998 or 1995, the Wetland Wildlife Care Center um, decided to sort of uh, take home base on our, air, on our property. Um, and so, you know, we work to restore and protect the wetlands and they work to, um, you know, restore and uh, sort of rehabilitate any sort of injured animals that um, come into the area that are from wetland habitats. And that means that uh, they also um, release a lot of those uh, healthy um, animals back into our marsh as well, as uh, along with other Southern California marshes. Now, um, a little bit more about what we do. So I mentioned it a little bit, but we, um, like to, you know, our main goal is to restore the wetland habitat to something, you know, that it used to be historically. It's not quite what it used to be, and I'll explain that in a little bit. Um, but, you know, we want to restore it to a functional wetland habitat to provide support for a lot of the unique species that we have in our wetland habitat. Um, we also want to maintain these wetlands for, um, you know, the animals that live there. So there's lots of endangered species and unique species that use uh, our wetlands and they rely on our wetlands for support. So it's important that we maintain it to the best of our ability so that it functions um, as a sort of supportive ecosystem. And we also educate the public, we educate schools, we educate scientists. So we have lots of research that goes on at Huntington Beach Wetlands Conservancy that I'll dive into later on. Um, and we sort of, you know, focus on educating the public about the importance of wetlands. I feel like when I was a kid, I grew up in Southern California, and I feel like I would drive past wetlands and I would think nothing of them. I just didn't really think they were interesting habitats. And I wasn't really exposed to them, but it wasn't until my master's degree that I learned how cool and how important wetland habitats really are. And I feel like we're starting to change that, especially with the help of um, OC Habitats is we're trying to, you know, get students and get kids out there to help them realize how important these, you know, backyard ecosystems are. And it's really important for us to protect and restore the remaining habitat that we have left. So a little bit uh, more about wetlands in general. So I'm going to talk specifically about tidal wetlands. Um, wetlands is sort of an umbrella term. It is land that is wet. And there are many types of wetland habitat. Um, specifically, the wetland habitat that we see in Southern California include estuaries and uh, marshes. 
So these um, estuaries or marshes uh, must have some sort of variable tidal flow. So we have uh, the tides coming in and out on a regular basis that's supplying salt water to these areas. Um, and we have lots of you know, unique animals and plants and organisms that are specially adapted to these types of habitats. And finally, another characteristic of these wetland habitats is they have a lot of fluctuation in salinity, temperature, water level, and just diversity overall in terms of the organisms that live on these habitats. So they are really productive ecosystems and they support a lot of wildlife. And they're also really dynamic and really interesting habitats. So the reason why wetland habitats are dynamic is because of that fluctuation in all those uh, abiotic parameters. So, you know, you have this tide that comes up and flows out twice a day. And what that does is it supplies salt water to, um, you know, the soil levels and or the soil that that's surrounding it. And that's going to allow or provide some sort of moisture for the plants that live there. It's also um, going to, you know, once that tide comes back down, what happens is the sun is beating on that soil that's going to start to evaporate the water, but it's going to leave the salt. And so that means the soil and wetland habitat tends to be really salty. And that's not great for a lot of plants. So um, many sort of, you know, freshwater plants cannot really survive in a marsh habitat. And um, instead, we have lots of plants that are specially adapted to live in these areas. Uh, for example, we have our iconic marsh plant pickleweed. So in this picture here, you can see this is the same species, um, but you'll see that they have different coloration. And the reason is that's part of their special adaptation for dealing with this high salinity soil. So pickleweed is usually green on a good day, I'll say, right? Um, but if they're uh, in a habitat that has, you know, all the water has been evaporated and this soil is, or the salt is left, and so it's really salty soil, they're still absorbing that water, absorbing that salt that's coming with that, and that's stressful for them. So they actually collect all the salt in their leaves, which makes it turn red, and then they sort of drop off those leaves so that they get rid of all the stress. So they're especially adapted for that kind of environment. We also have very unique animals that are adapted to these types of environments. Um, the fish you see on the bottom there is called a long jaw mudsucker. When you come into to, to look at a wetland habitat, especially at low tide, you'll notice that there are some areas that are exposed. And I don't know if you would believe me if I told you that those long jaw mudsuckers are living in that exposed creek habitat. And the reason they can do this is because they are specially adapted for this type of habitat. They have what's called a buccal cavity in their mouth that allows for them to actually just gulp air. And they have uh, like capillaries in their mouth that allows them, it's almost like it acts like a lung. So it allows them to get gas exchange and get oxygen from the air as opposed to from the water like normal fish would. So, um, you know, we have lots of really cool, unique, unique organisms that are specially adapted for living in this dynamic habitat that's constantly changing. Now, uh, wetlands are really important habitats. They provide protection to our coastal cities. Um, we have lots of high energy around, surrounding our coastal cities, like the ocean, like the storms, especially the storms we've seen, uh, you know, this past winter. And uh, wetlands actually provide a buffer for all of that energy. So if we did not have wetlands, we would see a lot more destruction to our coastal cities. And sometimes you even see, I mean, we even see destruction still. Um, and part of that is because we have reduced this, you know, so many of these buffer zones and we've built houses on top of those buffer zones. So they're right in the way of where, you know, we're supposed to get this absorption of energy. Um, Wetlands are also really good at filtering water, so that's really important. Um, they also uh, sequester carbon, so that helps to sort of fight uh, some, you know, stressors of climate change. Um, they provide a diverse and productive ecosystem, like I talked about. There's lots of special and unique animals that you only really see in a wetland habitat. Um, specifically, they provide nursery for commercially and recreationally important fish species. So if you like fish tacos, you need to save wetlands because um, that's where the California halibut like to have their babies. It's a safe place for them to have their babies. And there's, um, you know, it's not really a large 
habitat, not very, not really deep. So we can't really get too many large predators in there. Um, so the, a lot of times these baby fish are very safe and it's a very productive ecosystem. So there's lots of resources for them to grow big and strong before they head out into the big bad world. And finally, we have, um, as I've mentioned, it's habitat for a variety of unique and endangered species that I'll sort of dive into a little bit to show you the types of animals we have on our um, habitat. So I'm going to sort of uh, now transition into some recent events that we have seen in the past year at Huntington Beach Wetlands Conservancy. So I'm going to start off with our oil spill. We did have an oil spill, uh, unfortunately, on October 11, 2022. Um, we were one of the only marshes that were heavily impacted from this oil spill, um, specifically our Talbert Marsh was impacted. Um, so um, we, there was a spill of about 25,000 gallons of oil that um, unfortunately did find its way into our marsh. Um, there is still current monitoring going on to figure out you know, what the ultimate effects were of this oil spill. Um, but I'm sure you know many of you heard about that event, um, and we had lots of cooperation to help um, kind of save our wetland uh, for you know as best we could. Uh, but it was an unfortunate event. In addition, we also had um, an inlet closure. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about this in detail. This is sort of the research that we uh, conducted this year that I'm going to show you a little bit more of. Um, but the inlet closure meant that we had no water coming in and out of our marsh. And so there was no resupply of oxygen, no resupply of nutrients. And so our marsh was sort of being uh, deprived of those things. And uh, it was a five month long battle, which meant that we did have some die offs, unfortunately, that uh, really just included a lot of native fish species like top smelt, stingrays, California halibut, mullet, uh, croaker species. And due to, you know, we had low oxygen, we had very high salinity. I'll show you guys that evidence uh, later on. Luckily, uh, we had some great partners kind of help us out like AES, who are our, our neighbors. Um, they actually installed a pump that allowed um, them to bring fresh ocean water um, and supply it into our Magnolia Marsh. And as you can see, um, that really did improve the, uh, the uh, conditions in Magnolia Marsh. You can sort of see in that image, um, we see lots of our seagrass that's really visible. The water clarity is great and we see a school of top smelt there. So we're very thankful for uh, their help in kind of, you know, we were desperate. We needed something to happen so that we were, we could prevent, you know, the entire ecosystem from dying off. Um, and something really interesting that was sort of happened in the aftermath of the inlet closure is, you know, when the water is not coming in and out and you're not getting this sort of, um, you know, high and low tide constantly every day and you're not sort of, you know, um, consistently uh, bringing moisture to the sediment. What happens is that sediment, all that water starts to evaporate and the sediment even starts to dry up and crack, as you can see in that image on the left. And what that meant is these cracks sort of um, expose this collected oil that was deep in the soil and um, that started to seep out. So once we actually got our inlet open, we did see a lot of um, oil, which I believe was probably a mixture of like natural oil and some, un, you know, uh, anthropogenic oil um, that was sort of stored in our soil. And so that was sort of an interesting aftermath that we saw after we um, got our inlet opened. Um, now I sort of wanted to transition into the types of animals and or organisms that we tend to see on our marsh um, and the reason why it's really important for us to restore this habitat and to protect it. So we do have a lot of endangered and threatened species that either inhabit our marshes or su um, are supported by our marsh. So we do have the Ridgeways uh, rail that is inhabiting our marsh. Um, we also have salt marsh bird's beak, which is an endangered plant. Um, we have lots of that on our marsh and that's a, a really awesome thing to see. We have lots of building savanna sparrows, which are also threatened. They use uh, pickleweed to nest. And then we have some uh, birds that are supported by our marsh that include the snowy plover and the California least tern. In addition, as um, you guys have seen in the, the previous talks, we have lots of awesome plants on our marsh as well. Um, so we have, you know, eelgrass, which is a, a vegetation that grows in the water, and that is a really important nursery habitat for a lot of fish species. 
We have uh, sea lavender, a really beautiful native plant that grows in our marsh. Um, California brittle bush that grows in sort of the upper uh, uh, upland area. Saltwort is our uh, another iconic marsh uh, plant that's sort of succulent like. And then we have, we do have, while well, most of our, our habitat is marsh habitat, we do have some um, dune habitat as well. So we see lots of beautiful dune flowers that you guys have already sort of seen and talked about. Um, we have lots of awesome little critters, uh, little invertebrates that live in our marsh. So we have both land and marine invertebrates. So we have lots of different insects that you can see on a daily basis. We have a lot of cool marine invertebrates. Um, you can't always see the marine invertebrates unless you sort of, uh, you know, stick your, your hands into the water and, and get some mud or get some um, algae. You can start to see the life that thrives in our marsh. Um, one example is the Navinax that you see in uh, the picture below, a very colorful sort of sea slug-like organism. We have lots of oysters. Oysters are so important for filtering water. They do a great job at that. Uh, lots of different crabs. And uh, despite its scary name, the giant wolf spider, um, which is pretty giant, um, I do think this spider is a, a little bit cute if you look at it uh, long enough. Lots of different mammals use our wetland habitat as well. So we have opossums, raccoons, lots of squirrels, uh, rabbits, especially a family of coyotes. Um, and we also have salt marsh harvest mice. So uh, lots of different mice that actually live in our wetlands and they actually crawl upon the, the pickleweed and they're really cute. Um, usually they come out at night and uh, they, um, you know, they love the marshes and they actually, I've done some projects that we monitor these, these animals and um, they are good swimmers. They can swim through a marsh that, that's, you know, experiencing high tide. So they are well adapted to their environment. Lots of different bird species. Um, you know, these are only a few of them. Uh, one of the reasons why people like to come to wetland habitats is for birding because there are hundreds of species of birds that you can see, especially in the wintertime as they start to sort of, um, you know, travel through the area. Um, so you have like, you know, if you come to Huntington Beach wetlands, you'll for sure see a snowy egret. Uh, we see lots of mallards. We see cormorants, great blue herons that live near our marsh, uh, pelicans, both brown and white. So there's lots of awesome birds to see at Huntington Beach wetlands. And my favorite, because I am a fish biologist, we have lots of cool fish in our marsh as well. So as I mentioned, we have our California halibut, if you like fish tacos, our awesome long jaw mudsucker who is able to breathe air. We even have some shark species like the gray smooth hound shark. That's a little baby one that you see me uh, holding right there. Uh, we have bay pipefish. Bay pipefish are um, basically the seahorses of the bay. They're super cute. A lot of people like those, those fish. Uh, top small species, which are very important for our terns. Uh, they're the main food source of our terns. Uh, surf perch, among many other uh, really awesome uh, fish species that live in our wetland marsh. So um, now I'll sort of transition into the ongoing projects that we have at Huntington Beach. So um, one of these includes the quarterly bird count. So Sea and Sage Audubon Society comes out um, quarterly and they are um, a great group of people that go out into all four of our marshes and they you know, walk around the entire perimeter and report all the different species of birds that they see and the behaviors that they see. And um, they sort of work with us to provide us with that data, which I am currently working to make public so that um, everyone is able to sort of see the types of animals or types of birds that we um, see on our marsh throughout the year. Um, as I mentioned, we do have bird's beak on our uh, property. So we are the eighth site in California that has this endangered plant, which is really special. Um, so we do have this ongoing project where we monitor and with the help of um, tidal influence, we monitor the health of uh, this population of our bird's beak throughout our, our uh, three marshes right now that it's planted on. Um, and we're sort of going to start on a new uh, year of the project where we, um, you know, maintain the area with the help of OC habitats. And we also um, try to, you know, get more seedlings out there and monitor it throughout the, the rest of these years. 
Um, another project we're working on is a living shoreline project. Living shoreline is basically kind of what it sounds like. It is a shoreline that ha that is, you know, providing some sort of protection for um, the area surrounding it through uh, the stabilization of living organisms. So plants and oysters. Um, as you can see, this is our Talbert Marsh. Um, Talbert Marsh has some erosion going on on the edges. Specifically, we have erosion on this edge right here where we're losing, I believe about uh, maybe two inches per year at this point. This is coming dangerously close to a telephone pole. So um, we are currently in the works to create a living shoreline, uh, which is going to consist of putting down some core logs and some other natural material um, and building sediment on top of that and uh, planting some marsh vegetation to give it some stabilization and give it some protection to uh, kind of slow down that erosion. Um, in one of our marshes that's sort of hidden in the back, we have, we call it Upper Magnolia. It's part of the larger Magnolia Marsh. Um, we had an oil line that was running through that marsh. And uh, one of our projects was to remove that oil line so that we could restore that area. Um, now in doing so, and in, in sort of removing that oil line, um, there was sort of this area that was left kind of to, to remain like, un, it wasn't really a functional habitat. Um, it was sort of just this plain mud flat and there wasn't really any sort of functional water flow through it. That's a really important characteristic of wetlands. Um, so our plan was to create a um, sort of a, a water flow regime that mimicked that of a natural wetland habitat. And what I mean by that is we can't just create a big pond. Um, a big pond is not necessarily a wetland habitat. And um, you know that's, that won't do. As I mentioned, a wetland habitat is dynamic and you need a little bit more movement of, of particles and movement or uh, water and nutrients. And so part of that historic uh, you know, dynamic wetland habitat includes this sort of winding uh, flow of, of water. And so with the help of a lot of our volunteers and OC Habitats, we were able to um, construct this sort of winding creek-like structure to allow for better water flow in the back and to start to like supply that, um, those nutrients and oxygen to these areas in a way that a functional marsh would. Um, so that's sort of, you know, we finished that, uh, I want to say in the fall, sometime in the fall, and then um, we are starting to uh, revegetate the areas. This is sort of a um, aftermath of when the creeks were dug and we sort of had everything uh, pack in after all the rain. And we are currently working with a lot of groups that include some Girl Scout troops and some volunteers to help revegetate the area. So right now we have an ongoing monitoring project. So we um, planted different types of treatments with spiny rush. Spiny rush is a really important plant that is providing um, really important habitat for the Ridgeways rail, which was an endangered bird species. So we are currently running some sort of um, kind of in-field experiment to see what conditions spiny rush grows best in so that we can sort of create that habitat for that Ridgeways rail. And we have three treatments. So we have a uh, spiny rush by itself, spiny rush with other uh, spiny rush plants, and then spiny rush with a um, you know, diversity of other types of native marsh plants. So that research is ongoing, but the plan is uh, for the next few months here is to really start to revegetate this area and get more plants on those islands and all throughout those creeks. Now we also have a lot of groups that help us out with this type of work. So we have, uh, we've done many Eagle Scout projects. I believe we've done six Eagle, Eagle Scout projects up to this point, we are on our seventh. Um, and these Eagle Scout projects vary from providing some sort of educational um, support for our education center, um, providing you know, construction for research that can uh, be conducted on our property. Um, providing a dune pathway so that people who um, want to visit our wetlands can have a safe um, and sort of functional path for them to walk and hike along to view all the wildlife in our wetlands. And we also have um, some high school students who are conducting research um, on our property. So if you come by our marsh, you can see that this experiment is um, ongoing. So they, uh, these high school students, 
created some sort of experimental design where uh, they created three different treatments to see how well um, or, you know, what conditions cord grass could grow under it, uh, the best. And the reason that cord grass is important is because that's another plant species that is really important for the Ridgeways rail. Um, in addition, uh, you know, all throughout Southern California, cord grass is really not doing too well. And I think there's a combination of factors that include um, sea level rise, as well as some um, sedimentation patterns. And, um, you know, it's really important that, you know, we figure out how to best support the cord grass so that we can start to apply some of those things to our marsh to better support the cord grass and thus better support the Ridgeways Rail. Um, now, this is a really awesome experience for our high school students because they are actually getting experience creating experimental design and conducting the research. And um, shortly here or, or in the next few months, I will be working with them to help them analyze their data. And I think the goal is for them to get some sort of publication out of this, which is an amazing opportunity, especially at the high school level. Um, another project we have includes the Newland Marsh restoration. So we acquired our last piece of land that we wanted to restore. Um, currently, it is just sort of a, uh, you know, what all of these wetlands did look like before they were restored, which is sort of a dry uh, pit of mud. And uh, there's some water that, that gets in there, especially through the rain. Um, but, you know, it's not really necessarily a functional habitat. It's not what it used to be. And so the idea or the plan for us for the next five years is to restore this habitat to a more functional marsh habitat like the other three that we have. Um, so currently we are sort of working through to um, get the funding we need to get this process going, um, but we're really excited to, you know, see this project through and see that all of our marshes uh, will be restored to a functional marsh habitat. Um, we also have some uh, high school, other high school students that are coming out to conduct research. In fact, that's what I did earlier this morning. So we partner with ICRE um, to, you know, which basically goes out to a bunch of high schools in Orange County. And uh, in these like AP environmental classes or higher division biology classes, um, they, these students get the opportunity to go out into their backyard ecosystems and they are able to um, conduct their own research. So they figure out what kind of question they want to ask and we provide them with the resources they need to answer those questions. So um, right now we have Huntington Beach Wetland, or sorry, Huntington Beach High School that is coming out on a monthly basis to monitor water quality, to monitor the spiny rush treatments, to look at fowling communities, to look at bird communities and pollinators, uh, because these are all important elements that need to be monitored in wetland habitats. And we are getting you know, help from high school students to do this. And towards the end of the year, once they collect all their data, um, they will actually have the opportunity to present at a, at a big event. So uh, all of them will create a poster and they uh, all come together with all the other Orange County high schools and they all present their research to each other. And it's an awesome experience. Um, it's honestly something I wish I had the opportunity to do as a high school student. Um, we also have some involvement with other programs like the Cybax program. Uh, we had a student, Danielle, uh, or Danny, um, from Edison High School. And uh, basically this program is to help students sort of um, choose a mentor and do like a, a short little internship with them to uh, sort of shadow um, someone who might be doing a, a career path that they might want to pursue. So Danny is really interested in marine biology. So she reached out, reached out to us and um, we were able to sort of bring her out and show her how to conduct research on a marsh habitat. I mean, there are so many different elements to investigate in our marsh habitat. So we did some fishing. Uh, we showed her how to monitor plant restoration. Um, she also came out and did a lot of volunteering for us to help us sort of remove invasive species. And uh, next, you know, the next step of being a marine biologist and being a scientist is data analysis. So uh, the next steps are to sort of take all the data that she collected and start to analyze it and understand patterns in Huntington Beach wetlands. 
And um, we also have a lot of involvement and most of our involvement, most of the projects that we do at Huntington Beach Wetlands Conservancy would not be possible without the help of our volunteers. Um, so our volunteers do lots of activities that include uh, removal of invasive species. So what you see here is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds of uh, Russian thistle or tumbleweed. So throughout our drought years, um, Russian thistle just boomed. They loved it and uh, they grew all throughout our dunes. And so they were really taking over that habitat for the native species. So we, um, you know, got a lot of different volunteers to help out with this effort to uh, start to remove all of that, those invasive species. It was completely cleared in Magnolia Marsh and it is probably most of the way cleared in Brookhurst. We're still working through that, um, but it is an awesome effort. We also have lots of trash removal, which is a constant process, unfortunately, due to you know runoff that we get from rain and any sort of trash that finds its way into the ocean. It eventually finds its way back into the marsh because that tide will bring in the water and it will bring in the trash and that trash will get stuck on the vegetation and then it will remain there, um, which in some ways is good because it, it keeps the trash out of the ocean, but it means that all that trash is ending up in the marsh. So it's a really important effort that our volunteers help us keep our marsh clean. Lots of marsh restoration occurs, um, you know, any sort of nursery ma maintenance, um, you guys saw an image earlier of uh, the, actually, I think I have an image here. So here's our image of OC Habitats helping us out with lots of different projects. So we have a removal of those invasive species like ice plant. Uh, the picture you see in the bottom there are lots of our volunteers and OC Habitats helping to construct those channels. So those channels that I showed you earlier, this is sort of like in the works and it looks amazing now. So um, very awesome for all of that help. And most recently we worked on, um, you know, our, our, main, our next step of that project is to revegetate the area. So uh, in our last volunteer event, um, OC Habitats helped us get a lot of uh, plant plugs, native plant plugs, so that we could take those plants and transplant them into Upper Magnolia Marsh to start restoring that habitat. Um, now, if you guys would like to get involved, uh, we are always open the third Saturday of the month for Community Service Day from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Um, there's a couple ways you can find us. You can find us through the OC Habitats website to, to sign up. You can also find us through Just Serve. You can sign up through for the events there. And you can also go to our website that um, sort of has all the information there as well. So this happens, as I said, on the third Saturday of the month. And we also have um, lots of other opportunities to come out and volunteer as well. Um, you know, we're pretty much here uh, almost every Saturday and, and pretty much, you know, six days a week. So there's lots of opportunity um, to volunteer and help out, uh, help restore our marsh habitat. Um, so maybe with that, that's sort of my first part of my talk, uh, which is talking about Huntington Beach Wetlands Conservancy. Um, before I get into the research that we conducted this year, I can take a pause if anybody has any questions before I dive into the research. Chloe, I, you mentioned on the oil spill, I think your slide said it was the uh, oil spill of 2022, and I, I hate to correct, but I think it was 2021. Oh, no, yeah, you're, you're correct. Yes, yeah. awesome. <laughs> it was 2021. <laughs> And then I did I did put in the chat we, you talked about sea lavender and we do like sea lavender. However, we don't want Algerian sea lavender, which yes. is an invasive. So I put that in the chat and I also misspelled it. I apologize. I said seal <laughs> instead of sea. But um, that is a project that uh, I don't know that we're doing a lot of it at Huntington Beach right now, but we are definitely doing it in other wetlands. And obviously, if you start to see a larger population of it at Huntington Beach, we would want to remove the Algerian because it can take over. Yes. Anybody else have any questions for Chloe before she moves on to the next section? Oh, I might have missed this earlier, but you mentioned about the Living Shorelines project. Mm -hmm. um, do you know when that's going to start? That's a great question. Um, we've sort of been held up with the Upper Magnolia project as well as some Newland things that are going on. Um, but I think that the idea is for uh, once the next fall comes around, we will start to be, um, you know, getting that project going because we do have to be mindful of the nesting uh, season. So it's really hard for us to sort of get uh, 
into the marsh and do right during restoration when we have to be you know careful of all the other birds that are nesting in the area nice thank you mm -hmm. awesome it looks like we don't have any more questions or am i anyone else all right i think we can move forward chloe okay cool transition to my next one here okay so as I mentioned for the second part of my talk, I'm gonna talk about uh, research that we conducted uh, this past year. So um, I'm gonna tell you a little story about what happened in our wetland habitat when hydrological issues met environmental policy limitations. So um, this is sort of coming back to our five month long inlet closure that I'm going to dive into. So again, just to sort of um, you know review, uh, you know, honey, our, our, our Huntington Beach wetlands, uh, we know that over 80% of wetland habitat has been lost in Southern California. We know that the there's been massive reduction of that, uh, or we can see that massive reduction in Huntington Beach alone, as we can see that, you know, this was our historic Huntington Beach wetland habitat. So it's really important for us to, you know, restore these habitats and protect them, uh, at least what's remaining left of them. As we talked about, they do provide a lot of ecosystem services that we mentioned, like water filtration, habitat for lots of important species, all sort of review here. And, uh, and I mentioned like we have a lot of endangered and threatened species that are either living on our habitat or are supported by our habitat. So it's essential that, you know, we protect our habitat so that these species can also be protected um, and they can you know, thrive in their, these habitats. So we have our Ridgeways rail, building Savannah Sparrow and salt marsh bird's beak that actually lives on our marsh and relies on these sources there. So um, here's sort of a zoomed in image of our marsh. So I'm gonna start with our, our story time here. So here we can see our current uh, restored marshes that includes Talbert Marsh, Brookhurst, and Magnolia. So they were restored in that order. Talbert was our first marsh that was restored, followed by Brookhurst, then Magnolia. And um, we can see, you can sort of see the uh, Santa Ana River that's kind of blocked off over here. So we don't, we no longer get any sort of, uh, you know, freshwater input from that. Um, all freshwater input is coming from the rain, which we did get a lot of this year, and that's awesome. Um, but this marsh is mainly a saltwater marsh. As you can see, our inlet is coming from the ocean here that is providing any sort of tidal flow and, and uh, flushing in our marsh here. Now, the problem with this inlet is it does periodically close. And it periodically closes because the ocean swell will sometimes um, bring in sand in a certain way, and that sand will start to pile up and it creates a barrier. And that means that the water cannot get in or out of the marsh. And as I mentioned, this is a pretty normal process. Um, we've seen it happen uh, pretty much on an annual basis, but with a lot of things that are starting to change, uh, we are starting to see this process happen a lot more frequently. And just this past year in April or on April 12th, the inlet actually closed up abruptly and unexpectedly. So we, you know, did what our normal protocol is. So we reached out to Coastal Commission and we told them, hey, we need to clear our inlet so that we can get fresh water flow into our marsh. Um, and what happens after that is after we get clearance, then OC Public Works will go in there and they will use heavy equipment to actually clear all the sand so that we can get water flowing through our marsh again. Now, the problem is that we ran into some limitations. So um, I think it took about maybe three weeks for Coastal Commission to get back to us. And by that time, limitations, uh, some sort of biological limitations had begun. What I mean by that is the California least terns had started to nest, as well as the snowy plovers, and we were right in the peak season of grunion spawning. So all of these animals are protected. And as you can see in the map, they are very close to our inlet. So we have the California least turn preserve that is right next to our inlet. We had some snowy plovers that were nesting near the inlet. Um, and we also had um, many different grunion runs that were occurring during that time. Um, so because all of these, you know, um, you know, things were happening during this time, 
you know, it was a major concern to protect those species. So we got declined. We were unable to get heavy equipment in there to clear the sand out to get fresh water flowing into our marsh. So thus began our five month long battle to get the inlet opened, um, which meant that, you know, conditions began to change throughout that five month inlet closure. And researchers at California State University Long Beach uh, that worked in the wetland conservation and ecology lab were interested in the fish communities or the effect of this inlet closure on fish communities. So in yellow here, you can see all of the uh, locations that we uh, basically monitored fish communities. And the way we monitor fish communities is through going out and we pull what's called a seine net. So a seine net is one big net that is about 60, foot, uh, 60 feet long and about five feet tall that has a lead line and a float line. And we basically just have a person on the shore that is their anchor and one person that goes out into the water and we sort of just scoop um, all the fish into a net. And we count the fish species, we measure the fish uh, or the first 15 of each fish species that we get, and we record any sort of invertebrates that we catch as well. So um, that's sort of, you know, the start of our monitoring. Uh, we went out for once a month for three months consecutively. And um, we also had some, you know, monitoring of abiotic parameters that included salinity, temperature, and dissolved oxygen. Um, we know that our marsh habitat is a dynamic habitat and these things naturally fluctuate, but the organisms that live in the habitat are also dependent upon the condition of these parameters. So um, Moffat and Nickel, which is an environmental um, uh, engineering firm, were uh, really you know, interested in, uh, or they were invested in the health of our ecosystem as well. So they went out on a regular basis to monitor salinity, temperature, and dissolved oxygen. So what you're looking at now is, uh, you know, the change in all of these parameters across our three marshes. So throughout the inlet closure, you can see um, it's not super surprising. We did see some sort of increase in salinity. That's because as the water evaporates, you're just leaving the salt behind. So that salinity starts to increase. Uh, we did see a predictable rise in temperature, and that is um, partly because of the seasonal change as we were moving into the summer months. But also, if you're not getting fresh water coming in, you're not really flushing any, any of the warm water out. So it sort of just is one big bathtub that continues to heat up. And then we also had a, uh, a drop in dissolved oxygen. So, um, you know, there's only so much oxygen that you have in your closed system. Um, and if it's not being resupplied by the ocean water, then we start to see that drop. And that dashed line that you see represents, um, you know, the minimum critical value. So um, anything below that value is a concerning condition. So, um, as we started to see that drop in dissolved oxygen, right, in the sort of mid-June, we actually um, observed our first die-off. Um, in response to this die-off, OC Public Works was able to install aerators that was able to recirculate the water, that it, the existing water in our marsh, to at least get some sort of resupply of surface oxygen levels. Um, as you can see, it did not increase oxygen levels, but it at least maintained the um, habitat at a like minimum. So here we have some evidence of our die-off that includes a lot of benthic invertebrates like the innkeeper worms. We had a lot of bubble snails. Um, usually the benthic uh, or the bottom of the habitat is the most stressful in terms of oxygen. Um, so it makes sense that these were the first organisms to go. Um, we also had a lot of fish species that included mo some mullet as well as two, over 200 top smelt that uh, were recorded dead. Um, top smelt, tend to be sensitive fish, so it makes sense that they went first, but it's also, you know, really important to consider given that top smell are the main food source of the California least term. So uh, this sort of caused some concern and we were able to uh, work with the agencies and get an emergency permit to at least clear the inlet a little bit with some limitations. So those limitations included, um, you know, we had to have the quietest material possible, which meant we couldn't bring excavators out there uh, with a dump truck because the dump truck 
beeps as it backs up, and that could be disturbing to the California least tern among the other species. And we had to do it within a window where the grunion were not running. Um, and we had to make sure that we were staying far away from the California least tern preserve. So the uh, sort of dimensions of the clearing of the inlet were uh, limited as well. Now, unfortunately, um, these were sort of wasted time and times and efforts. So um, as we cleared the inlet for, or as OC Public Works cleared the inlet every day with um, the uh, bulldozers that they had, um, it just wasn't enough. They couldn't get deep enough and the water would just bring in the sand right back every night and re-block it up. So this was a three day process that unfortunately did not um, do much help in terms of opening the inlet and getting us some fresh uh, water supply. Now um, we did get, uh, you know, we were, we were worried about the condition of our marsh as we started to get into the heat of the summer because you started to get, you know, more conditions that were worsening. So we did get um, uh, AS to help us out and install that pump to help resupply some water. So on this map, now you can see where AS is in the top and they supplied a pump that um, brought fresh water into Magnolia Marsh. And I, as I showed you earlier, it really did help the conditions in Magnolia Marsh, but um, you know, this is sort of a, a very long distance for that water to travel. So it took a long time for that water to circulate down to Talbert Marsh. So by the heat of the summer, um, you know, just before that water started to reach Talbert Marsh, we did end up seeing another fish die off, unfortunately. This included fish that are more charismatic species like stingrays, California halibut, um, croaker species, among other invertebrates. Now, this caused a lot of public concern, especially not, not only because it looked bad, it also smelled bad. And um, we were able to, at this point, uh, get enough support to um, finally open our inlet by the beginning of September. Now, um, you know, I, the initial or the main point of this project was to assess fish communities. So I'm gonna go through different groups of fish communities and the effect of the inlet closure. So um, on the left-hand side, you're gonna see an average abundance of these fish communities across the different marsh through time. And then on the right-hand side, you're gonna see um, how the fish or the average abundance of the fish changed with salinity and dissolved oxygen. So we're gonna start with our native pelagic fish. So these include top smelt and California killifish. So we noticed that there's sort of a negative uh, association with salinity. So as conditions worsened, these fish were sensitive to that. So they were the most sensitive um, and especially we can see top smelt were the first to go. Um, so that, that makes sense that they were, um, you know, not doing so hot in these types of conditions. Um, we can see some sort of uh, marsh-like or marsh-specific patterns with the native fish. Um, but we do see a significant drop in these fish in July when the conditions were worse in Talbert. When it comes to the non-native pelagic fish, which are basically the non-native counterparts of the native fish I mentioned previously, we have the inland silverside and the rainwater killifish. These fish, unsurprisingly, were not sensitive to either salinity or dissolved oxygen. Um, you know, that makes sense. That's a very good characteristic of non-native fish. They are good at kind of, um, you know, tolerating conditions like this, which make them good at invading. Um, we can see that there are some marsh specific condition or uh, patterns. So we see that specifically there's, um, so we start to see some evidence of an increase in these fish in Magnolia Marsh, which tends to be the area that um, usually has, you know, worse conditions being farther from the inlet. When it comes to native benthic fish, this includes our goby species like the long jaw mudsucker and arrow gobies. Um, these fish also weren't very sensitive to the changes in the conditions. In fact, they were positively associated with salinity. So they weren't really doing, um, you mean, they, they were fine with the conditions. And this sort of makes sense because as I mentioned, long jaw mudsuckers are really robust species. They are able to breathe air um, and they're also able to tolerate wide variations in temperature. So it makes sense that these species were, um, you know, not as sensitive to these changes. Now, um, the conditions were constantly changing across the marshes, depending on where the pumps were, depending on where the aerators were, depending on, you know, if we got some sort of water flow into the inlet. So I sort of wanted to show you, you know, what types of fish communities we saw as the conditions changed throughout the marsh. 
So this is an NMDS plot that shows you like, um, you know, it groups up the marshes and the time periods by similarity in terms of the um, types of fish seen there. And I've also grouped them by the abiotic parameter. So as uh, you can see in the green bubble below, this is during normal conditions when we have good salinity, good dissolved oxygen, good temperature. We see fish like the top smelt, as well as giant kelp fish and shiner surf perch, which makes sense because these fish are most sensitive to stressful habitats. As we start to move into more stressful habitats that include either high salinity or uh, low oxygen, we start to see some California killifish and rainwater killifish. Generally, these are pretty robust species and rainwater killifish being the invasive one makes sense. Um, as we started to get into worse conditions that included both high salinity and low oxygen, we start to see some more goby species like the arrow goby. And finally, by the time that the conditions were most critical, we had high salinity, high temperature and low oxygen. We start to see more goby species like the long jaw mudsucker, like the shadow goby, as well as the um, non-native inland silverside. So some takeaways from this research includes that we saw that native fish or native pelagic fish were the most effect, heavily affected. And in fact, all of our fish die-offs included all native species. We also saw a massive die-off of sedentary benthic invertebrates that includes a major proportion of our oysters, as well as those innkeeper worms I showed you, lots of bubble, wor our bubble snails. And sadly, we did have a significant decline in eelgrass habitat. This is sort of a snapshot of Talbert uh, pre and post um, you know, our inlet closure. As a response of that inlet closure, we did see a significant decline of that eelgrass, which means you have a significant decline of that important nursery habitat for those commercially and recreationally important fish species. So lessons learned include that cooperation with agencies outside of the environmental branch can be helpful. We were very thankful for AES's um, contributions to helping our march when we were most desperate. Um, communication between environmental agencies does need to improve. Um, you know, had the turnaround time for the response initially not took through, not or had it not taken three weeks, um, we could have prevented all of this from happening. Uh, because by that time it was too late, the uh, California Lee Stern had already begun nesting. Uh, we also need implementation of a better emergency plan, which we are sort of working with uh, the engineering firm, OC Public Works right now to figure out what kind of options we have. Um, but also, I think we just need to gain a better understanding of how disturbance like clearing the inlet truly affects species like the California Leastern, the California Grunion, and the Snowy Plover. Um, you know, one observation that our biologists made were that when we were doing the emergency inlet clearing, um, it really seems like the behavior of the Leastern didn't, they, they weren't affected. Um, so that's kind of stuff is kind of important for us to know so that we can be better informed if this is something like this were to happen again. So with that, um, I would like to thank all the people who helped, uh, um, you know, maintain and monitor the conditions of our marsh. And for those of you, if you know, if you like statistics, I have some supporting statistics for the uh, graphs that I showed you um, previously. And uh, with that, I will take any other uh, questions you guys might have about the research that was conducted or just questions about Huntington Beach Wetlands Conservancy.